So um, the topic of my today's report is a step road of Indo-European dispersal, some preliminary considerations. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say that um, the material is just uh, immense and uh, no one individual researcher can uh, solve all the puzzles of uh, early Indo-European history uh, and the history of their uh, migration. Uh, the material uh, I'm going to uh, demonstrate and present to you uh, has been gathered uh, during the last 10 years. Uh, so I start. Uh, firstly, an introductory note. This report presupposes a report by me uh, made for Stangam Talks uh, on the 29th of January, 2023. And I uh, remember the first preliminary scientific restriction that the common Indo-European cultural vocabulary means animal husbandry, agriculture, crafts, wheel transport, and use of copper. Uh, that means uh, that uh, common Indo-European cultural vocabulary means a chalcolithic uh, stage of material culture development. To make it simple, uh, we need copper, uh, copper tools, uh, copper weapons, copper ornaments uh, uh, to uh, start talking about the appearance of Indo Europeans. And the last, uh, the Regveda is early Harappan, 3200 to 2600 BC, and the Veda is mature Harappan, 2600 to 1900 BC. And I uh, want to uh, I want you to pay attention to the fact that there is a direct connection between the Neolithic rite of corpse laying in a crouched position on its side in Mergach uh, and the ritual of cremation according to the description of the late Rekveda hymn in two respects. Namely, the abundant sprinkling of the floor of the burial chamber, inventory and the body of the deceased with red ochre, and even the placement of lumps of ochre in the grave in Mergach and oak uh, means a symbolic fire, corresponds to the actual cremation of the corpse in the Rig Veda. Now you can see uh, the uh, photos from Nergar uh, Cemetery, and uh, the lumps of uh, red oak um, are indicated by white arrows. Secondly, the accompanying uh, sacrifice of young goat placed together with the deceased in Nergar corresponds to the accompanying burning of the goat together with the corpse in the Regveda and the Adharva. Uh, this is the illustration to uh, uh, two graves with goats. And uh, some uh, Regveda and Adharva Veda information. Uh, they uh, have almost uh, the same, uh, almost the same uh, verse. Uh, uh, the translation uh, of Tatiana Yakuna Yelizarenkova, an eminent Russian vidologist. Uh, the goat is a share, fry him with heat, let your flame roast him, let your ray roast him. And all of the same, uh, her translation of Akharva Veda Shonaka. And her commentary is the following. The goat, according to the funeral ritual, was tied up near the cremation fire so that he would draw off its heat. Uh, so, uh, judging by this uh, information, we can state that uh, the Vedic population and uh, Mergach population originated from one common stem. And now about the Indo-European home homeland in the border region between Iran, Bactria Margiana, and Hindustan. Archaeological evidence. The earliest Neolithic or heaven productive economy settlements in the border region between Iran, Bactria, Margiana, and Hindustan are the following. They are Hirana on the Saraswati River, Mergar on the Balan River, the tributary of the Indus River, Sangi Chakmak in the northeastern Iran, and Jitun uh, to the north of uh, Ashgabat uh, in uh, today's uh, Turkmenistan. So we have the illustrations. Um, I've already uh, demonstrated them uh, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, Nergar, Hirana photos. And now J2, black points indicate a great many sequels uh, found, uh, discovered uh, in the houses and around the house. 
and some um, illustrations of San Gechek Mark building structures uh, of uh, the West Tepe and the East Tepe, the two main parts of the settlement. So the inhabitants of Hirana on the Saraswati left crucible fragments with molten copper already in period 1A of the Hakra West culture, dated uh, by radiocarbon uh, from 75 to uh, 60 double O. The uh, inhabitants of Hirana uh, used all, already copper bangles, rings, and arrowheads uh, in period 1B of the early Harappan culture. It is not my uh, term, it is the term of the excavators, uh, 60 double O to 45 double O BC. And this is the photo of Hirana copper bangle and arrowhead of period 1B of the early Harappan culture. The inhabitants of Mergarh on the western tributary of the Indus River Balan, independently of the Middle East, domesticated zebu cattle uh, at least in the 7th uh, millennium uh, BC. Uh, professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Oregon in Eugene, John Lukas, uh, states uh, that a comparison of the teeth of Natufians of Syro Palestine. Mergarchians and uh, modern Indo Aryans uh, showed the absence of kinship of the latter two groups with the first, and the presence of a direct, direct uh, genetic link between the creators of Mergar and the current population of Western and Central India. And copper beads were excavated from a burial dated to 60 00 to 55 00 BC from Neolithic period 1 level at Mergar. Uh, the funerary chamber was sealed by a low uh, mud brick wall containing the remains of a male adult and a child. The adult lay on its uh, left side with the legs flexed back. This is the photo. Uh, eight copper beads were found next to the adult's left wrist. Uh, several cotton threads were also discovered in one of the beads. And uh, later, lost wax cast copper ornaments excavated at, at Mergar in the early. Uh, Chalcolithic uh, level dated to the end of period three, uh, that is between uh, 45 double O and uh, 60, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 36 double O BC. Uh, so we can uh, uh, state that uh, the use of copper started around uh, uh, the beginning of the sixth uh, millennium BC in this region. And this is uh, the photo of the last box uh, cast object from Mergarh. The collection of Mergarh is characterized as, as archaic. It is a Neolithic type industry, similar in many respects to that of Jaipur in southern Turkmenistan. And Mergarh's materials reveal close analogies in Jaipur uh, in southern Turkmenistan and San Gichikmak in the northeastern Iran. Uh, these are two photos from the Neolithic site of San Gichikmak near Shahrut in northeastern Iran, a house model and a hook-shaped bone sickle from San Gichikmak. San Gichikmak is the only site with a complete sequence of uh, from a ceramic Neolithic to transitional, uh, transitional uh, Chalcolithic. Uh, the uh, settlement of the West Tepe dates to circa uh, 70 double O to 67 uh, double O BC, and the settlement of the East Tepe dates to circa uh, 62 double O to 53 double O BC. The late ceramic Neolithic face levels of San Gichikmak show a number of similarities to G2 period sites in southern Turkmenistan. And this is the um, painted pottery design comparison uh, between Tepe and Gichikmak and Jitun sites. Uh, so you see the similarity <coughs> of the uh, ornaments. New radiocarbon dates from the site of Jitun provide a range of uh, 63 00 to 57 00 BC. Uh, some other similarities of uh, San Gichikmak to Jitun are the use of long cylindrical mud bricks, uh, cosmetic vials, uh, flat circular and square spindle whorls made of stone, hook shaped bone sickles, and zoomorphic figurines. Um, it is interesting that the findings of cowrie shells from the Indian Ocean in Jitun speak about the ties with India, as far as India. 
both sexes of the West and East Tepes, uh, Tepe Sangichik Mak belong to the early Iranian populations, close to those of Shahri Sokta, Sialk period 1 to uh, 4, Tepe Hisar, and uh, the uh, Dailaman uh, village uh, Kranich Toy. The skeletons from the West Tepe were lying on their right sides uh, in contracted positions. The skeletons from the east tepe were lying on their sides in extended positions, uh, three on their left and five on their right side. And uh, these are uh, the illustrations of the east tepe inflammations extended on the back, or on, on the side. In Mergarh from period one, the dead were buried crouched on their sides and sprinkled with oka and the Jitun culture to demonstrate uh, the gradual transition to this funeral rite, which indicates the penetration of a new population into the south of Central Asia. I connect it with the Mergarh. Uh, this is the illustration of some um, inhumation, inhumations crouched on their sides from Mergarh, period one and one uh, from period two. And they continue up to the end um, of this uh, culture. The dead were buried crouched on their sites uh, in the south of Central Asia in Turkmenistan in the Neolithic, uh, Neolithic and Early Bronze Age. That is from the beginning of the 6th up to the uh, 3000 BC by the Jitun cultural traditions heirs, uh, such as Alpin Depe, Namazga Depe, etc. And in the largest in this region, Ganur Depe burial complex in the Murgab Delta in the last centuries of the Third, first centuries of the second millennium BC. The creators of the Hisar Neolithic culture uh, buried their dead already in the uh, sixth millennium BC in a crouched position on their side, uh, as in the graves of Tutkaul and Sai Sayed, 45 kilometers southeast of Dushanbe. The inhabitants of the southeastern Caspian region were uh, buried on their sides with their legs bent and their hands folded in front of their face or chest in uh, 35 00 to 1000 uh, BC. In Makran in Pakistan, in Shahitub, uh, level 3a, uh, 35 00 to uh, 30 00 BC, the dead were also buried crouched on their side. Excavations of the gigantic necropolis, uh, circa uh, 20,000 burials of Shahri Sokta in the Helmut Delta, uh, dated to the late 4th, 3rd uh, millennium BCE on the Iran-Afghanistan border, showed that most of the skeletons were lying in a crouched position uh, on their side. The craters of the Farkhor burial ground in southern Tajikistan at the turn of 3rd and 2nd thousand BCE and the inhabitants of Sapalitic Pem, 1700 to 1500 BC in southern Uzbekistan, as well as uh, the inhabitants of Dashli, 2000 to 1250 BC in northern Afghanistan, also buried their dead in a crouched position on their side. Uh, but the main recorded funeral rite of the material Harappans, uh, 2600 to 1900 BC, was a corpse uh, stretched on its back. Uh, this is exactly the situation observed in the necropolises of Kalibangan, Harappa, Lathal, Arakhi, Garhi, Farmana, and Rupa. And the creators of this funerary tradition, circa 1900 BC, moved uh, to the northeast of the upper reaches of the Satlej and the Saraswati rivers, and uh, to the Yamuna Ganga Daab, as evidenced by the Sonoli burial ground belonging to this transitional era with skeletons still stretched on their back. Uh, these are the examples uh, from the Matthew Harappan uh, uh, cemeteries. So we can uh, speak about two main recorded uh, burial tradition, uh, traditions, and humation uh, traditions of the Indo-European homeland. Uh, one is pre-Iranian, crouched on the site information, and the second is pre-Indo-Aryan, extended on the back information. And this is a, a simple map drawn by me uh, to demonstrate these two uh, territories. And as you can see, the um, Balochistan territory, the uh, western boundaries, borders of uh, the Sindhu Valley, uh, was the contact zone uh, between these two burial traditions. Uh, there were some uh, migrants from uh, pre-Iranian territory 
uh, bringing this uh, burial uh, tradition even to the mature Harappan cemeteries. And uh, the mature Harappan uh, tradition of extended on the back uh, information was carried uh, as far north as uh, the Arim um, Basin, that is Xiaohe uh, Cemetery and Gumgul Cemetery and so on, of the second uh, millennium BC, but it is not the topic of uh, today's report. You see the dispersal direction uh, indicated by uh, red and green uh, arrows. The techniques of house building and the use of uh, stones in hearths uh, for cooking, which is still done in Balochistan, are similar in Jeytun and Nergar also. A uh, leading researcher at the Central Asia and Caucasus Department of the Institute of Material Culture History of the Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, Ludmila Kercho, states uh, that there are traces of direct contacts between the populations of Balochistan and the Zirafshan Valley uh, Sarazm settlement already at the end of the uh, fourth millennium BC. And this is uh, the map um, um, drawn by me, so to say, collected by me, uh, constructed. And uh, you can see uh, Balochistan uh, migration to Sarazm, and the majority of Sarazm population um, was of uh, Gyaksur uh, origin. Uh, but then uh, people from Balochistan came and brought their uh, pottery. Uh, it is uh, also demonstrated here. Uh, Doctor of Historical Sciences, Professor, Director of the Institute of the History of Material Culture of the Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, Masson, states that in Sarazm, above the complex of uh, Gyaksur local variant of the Jitun derived anal culture, there is a layer with painted ceramics made on a potter's wheel with motives clearly of Middle Balochistan appearance. And uh, then we uh, record uh, the presence of Indians among the creators of the Namazga 4 and Namazga 5 uh, and Bakri Morgana archaeological complexes. Uh, firstly, the typical Matthew Harappan settlement of Short Pugai was founded at the confluence of the Kokche and Amudarya in eastern Bactria. Then the Harappans uh, uh, penetrated into the Namazga territory, living in great Canelian beads and other things. Um, in Altin de Pe. Uh, the same beads were found in looted graves in northern Afghanistan, and another one, along with the Harappan bull figurine, was found in the Bektri Margiana archaeological complex palace in Dersley 3. So I've tried to uh, demonstrate it. Now, uh, some uh, mature Harappan materials from Shakuga in eastern Bactria, uh, they are very uh, expressive, so to say. Mathieu Harappan silver, the Renaissance Ceres, and uh, peacock. Uh, Painted pottery of Matteo Harappa. Uh, the analogies with Harappan materials found at Altin de Pe are characterized as numerous and varied. The Harappan influences observed in ceramics and mythology are explained by direct imitation of ancient Indian, Indian items. One fifth of the Harappan shapes have correspondences in local ceramics. And here uh, you can see uh, some of the examples of the uh, Harappan items in Alpine de Pe, discovered uh, during the ex excavations. The uh, three headed animal corresponds to uh, three headed uh, bulls uh, and uh, Matthew Harappan seals um, with these depictions. Uh, then we have ivory uh, plain uh, sticks and two uh, Matthew Harappan uh, seals, one of them with a swastika sign. Male figurines found at Altin de Pe indicate the penetration of certain cults from the Indus Valley. Traces of steady and systematic impact of Matthew Harappa on Altin de Pe is recorded during late Namazga 4, that is uh, 30 00 to 25 00 BC, and Namazga 5 uh, phases, uh, 25 00 to 22 00 BC. Uh, Doctor of uh, uh, Historical Sciences, Professor Masson, also states that the findings of mature Harappan seals in Altin de Pe, including those with Proto-Indian texts, force us to turn to the question of the ethnic ties of the local population in the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. A very uh, eminent Soviet and Russian archaeologist, Doctor of Historical Sciences, head of the Russian Turkmen Margiana Archaeological Expedition, Viktor Saryanidi, states that, numerous, that there are numerous imitations of mature Harappan items, architecture, architectural borings, and inputs uh, from the Indus Valley 
that were revealed on the sites of the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex on the territory of Turkmenistan. Uh, he continues uh, that the close mutual similarity of the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex in Margiana and the Indus Valley uh, civilization is evident. Uh, and uh, here are some uh, of material Harappan items, um, such as seal with an elephant. Pay attention to the bowman and uh, trident uh, signs, uh, figurine um, uh, of uh, Harappan origin, and ivory mosaics from Ganordepe, the capital city of this uh, archaeological complex. Also, material Harappan ivories, uh, perforated jugs, and uh, a monkey figurine uh, at Ganordepe. And uh, a material Harappan, or uh, particularly Mahenjadara building type, at Ganur de Pe, so they, uh, a comparison. And uh, one of the Zibubul depictions, uh, Zibubul seal of Bektor Margana archaeological complex. A bronze um, cork axe, speaking of uh, South Asian origin, and um, ivory uh, plain sticks from Ganur de Pe, also about the same. Then we have the Sepali culture of the Bronze Age, 1750 to 1000 BC, that was created in the south of Uzbekistan in the Amudarya Basin by the Namazga 6 uh, population, uh, dated 22 uh, 002 1500 BC, uh, coming from the uh, Bakpreya Margiana archaeological complex of Turkmenistan. Uh, I've tried to draw uh, the map. Uh, I hope it is uh, clear. Uh, I pay attention to the cremation and tree fires, which is mentioned in a very late part of that Harvaveda in the book 18. It was recorded among the carriers of the late Harappan culture who came out of the Indus Valley in approximately 1600 to 1500 BC and joined the area of the Sapali culture at the Buston stage. Uh, here uh, you can see the map drawn by me. Uh, uh, the location of this Malali uh, cemetery, a Lake Harappan pottery of Malali, um, comes from Lake Harappan, uh, as uh, per Askara, uh, an excavator, the excavator of these uh, burials. Uh, and uh, more illustrations, brick cremation chamber, uh, chambers of Lake Harappan migrants to Sipoli territory um, in Bactria at uh, Buston Necropolis, uh, mentioned uh, in Akarva Veda. And uh, one more illustration, and uh, more. And here you can see the uh, photos of the brick cremation chambers with burnt human bones in the bottom uh, of late Harappan migrants to split territory. And now speaking about the cremation and tree fires in the Atharvaveda, let us uh, cite the Vilizarenkova translation of the book 18, uh, the path of uh, the Angerasis is the eastern fire, the path of the Adityas, um, the fire of the householder, the path of sacrificial gifts is the southern fire. May the eastern fire burn you in front, may the fire of the householder burn you from behind, may the southern fire burn your shelter. O Agni, burn him from behind, from the front, from above, from below, burn it. One threefold of Jata Vedas uh, from all sides. May the lighted fires embrace. The sacrifice ascended onto a folded bonfire ready to fly into the sky. Um, I pay attention to the fact that cremation and tree fires, uh, as described for the first time in the Atharva Veda, um, doesn't uh, mention the construction of any brick crematoriums. It means uh, then that this uh, late Vedic rite should be recognized as the prototype of the Buston triple cremation rite of Sepoli culture of Bek. Now, uh, Indo European uh, homeland in the border region between Iran, Bektra, Margiana, and Hindustan, anthropological evidence. The territory from Azerbaijan to Punjab, anthropological, represents the area of the Indo Afghan branch of the Caucasians whom we consider to be the earliest areas of Indo-European speech. 
uh, Russian anthropologist, director of the Institute of Archaeology of the Soviet Academy of Sciences in Moscow, and member of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, um, Valery Alexeyev, states that the ancestral homeland of the Indo-Iranians in the light of paleoanthropological and anthropological data is outlined within a vast area covering the south of Central Asia and the Iranian islands. Uh, he continues that in the southeast, at least the Indus Valley is included in the original uh, area of the Indo Evdans. In the northwest, the range of Indo Evdans includes the eastern Transcaucasia, in particular the valleys of the Kura and Arax rivers. The Chalcolithic uh, inhabitants of Mergarh in Balochistan from at least uh, 45 BC were anthropologically related to the inhabitants of Harappa of the Bronze Age, typical in the Afghans. In the Afghans have lived at the junction of Iran and Hindustan since at least the Neolithic era, as evidenced by the paleoanthropological study of the skeletons of the Neolithic settlement San Ich Kmak in northeastern Iran also uh, already mentioned. Uh, Sangichik mark in northeastern Iran, in both sexes, the average cranial index of all individuals falls on a uh, dolichic cranium, but close to hyperdolichic cranium of people of the Mediterranean type, identified in these parts of the periods uh, Sialk from 1 to 4 and Hisar 3 in Iran, uh, although the faces from uh, Sangichik mark were not so narrow. Jeetun culture people were also already of the indo afghan anthropological type. In the south of Central Asia, the valley of the Zarafshan River served as the northern boundary of the indo afghan area in the Neolithic and Bronze Ages. And this is uh, the uh, uh, map, uh, so to say, an anthropological map drawn by me up to uh, 1000 BC, the Zarafshan River Valley. Um, you see the red uh, arrow indicating uh, it, uh, state a boundary, anthropological boundary between indo Athens and the Proto-Europeans. Here they are represented by the Srubne and Andronova Bronze Age cultures of the Eurasian steppes. Uh, so you see they tried to move to the northern boundaries of the indo Athens uh, territory, but they did not penetrate uh, further, uh, farther uh, south uh, into Iran itself into uh, the south of uh, Central Asia, Afghanistan, and uh, South Asia, uh, at least up to 1000 BC, according to uh, anthropologists. And it is very late uh, for our uh, dating of Rig Veda and the Harva Veda and for the dispersal of the early Indo-Aryans already. So you see the connection, uh, uh, the interconnection between in the Athens of this region, and they were moving from the Iran uh, uh, South Asia boundary in the western direction and in the uh, north uh, um, uh, western directions. As far uh, west as Kura and Arax, uh, Arax uh, valleys in, in uh, eastern tra Transcaucasia, and even further to Europe, but it is also not the topic of today's report. Um, North Indian variant of the indo afghan type includes large ethnic caste groups of the population of modern India. Uh, it is the Rabin's uh, words, uh, I will mention him later. Brahmins, uh, Gujars, Ahirs, Jats, Rajputs, and representatives of the higher castes of southwestern India, Dishastha, Chitpavan, uh, Chandrasenia, Brahmins particularly, but not only them. Um, Russian anthropologist, archaeologist, candidate of biological sciences, doctor of historical sciences, head of the ethnic ecology sector of the Institute of Ethnology and Anthropology of the Russian Academy of Sciences, and also the head of the Russian Turkmen Margiana archaeological expedition, Nadezhda Anatolina Dubova, points to the kinship of the populations of Iran, Pakistan, the Indus River Valley, the southern regions of Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan in the uh, Bronze Age. She continues, the male Ganurians uh, have almost uh, the narrowest uh, head, narrow and high face, nose and orbits among all the aforementioned groups. The somewhat higher face, nose and orbits are peculiar only to groups five and four uh, from the lays from Hassan Iran and from R37 uh, cemetery of Harappa. 
she also continues, the Iranian Tepehisar to Mahenjadar, Budkar in the Swat River Valley, and Tigrova Balka 3 IQ in the southern Tajikistan Bronze Age skulls are similar in latitudinal dimensions to the skulls of the Ganur Nikol. The R37 cemetery skulls of Harappa have almost the same altitude indicators as both the Ganur and Hassan Lu series, and according to latitude indicators, they practically merge on the grave with the Ganur ruins. Harappa H cemetery skeletons differ greatly from R37 cemetery in both factors, latitude and altitude, approaching the series from Tigrova Balka 1, Baksh River, uh, from Dalverzin and Zerafshan Zagan, and having somewhat higher altitude and latitude indicators. The G2200 uh, uh, and uh, 89 cemetery series of Harappa turns out to be very similar to the skulls from the Iranian Shakri Sokta and Tajik Makonimor. The G289 cemetery series of Harappa are close to Turkey and Parhai Dva in the southeastern Caspian region, and Pehisar three skulls are uh, overrun. Taking into account uh, the convergence of the Ganur series, necropolis, and ruins with the sites of the Indus Valley civilization, on the one hand, um, summarizes Dubova, and on the other, with groups living south of Kopitda, we can say uh, that between these regions, there were wave-like population movements. Uh, now, a physical anthropologist, doctor of medical sciences, candidate of biological sciences, Professor Ginsburg states, Dolichicranic Caucasoid or Mediterranean type is characteristic of the regions uh, to the south and west of the Amudria, where it has been predominant since the Bronze Age. For example, Jitun derived now and Namazgatepe and Turkmenistan to the present uh, days, uh, Turkmenistan, Iran, northern India, and the southern slopes of the Hindu Kush. He continues so that the population of the south of the Pamir in the first millennium BC, first millennium AD, also had a pronounced Dolichocranic Caucasoid type. The same type was characteristic there for the population of the Saka of Scythian culture and for later times, at least until the middle of the uh, first millennium BC. In the Bronze Age, the, the Dolichocranic Caucasoid type was widespread north of the Amudria, Indectria, and Sogdiana and Sardana. Uh, my conclusion is uh, that uh, Indo Afghans have continuously been living at the junction of Iran and Hindustan from the Neolithic up to the present. No other population could have become the first speakers of the Indo European and then Aryan languages in this region except Indo Afghans. And about Ginsburg, uh, once more, uh, he states that uh, the ancient Caucasoids of the south of Central Asia at the end of the 5th uh, to second millennia BC, had an anthropological type with equatorial signs of Hindustan, similar first of all to the Neolithic and Bronze Cranian series from Langanj and Ladga. South, uh, uh, South Central Asian skulls are related to those from Mahenjadara, Harappa and Timargarh in northwestern Pakistan, where the East Mediterranean Dolichic Cranic uh, racial type also prevails. Now, head of the Laboratory of Anthropological Reconstruction of the Institute of History, Language and Literature of Ufa Federal Research Center of the Russian Academy of Sciences, Nech Valoda, states that the population of the equatorial appearance has penetrated into the territory of Central Asia repeatedly since ancient times with the tribes moving from the south, that is from India, along the Tijangara route from the Indus Basin. And he continues, uh, the Vidoid Dolichocranic uh, Pragnathos type of India is known on several settlements, Hisar, Kish, Sial, uh, Mahenjadara, and Timargar. Now, uh, I state that uh, Indo-European homeland was located closer to the Himalayas and Tibet on the one hand, and to southern India on the other. This is evidenced by the traces of the existence of existence of linguistic contact zones identified by Igor uh, Tanayan Belaev in the European Tibetan zone and in the European Dravidian zone. Igor Tanayan Belaev is a linguist, polyglot, master in Russian, Sanskrit, ancient Greek, Latin, English, Polish, German, Spanish, Farsi, classical Tibetan, and Yucatec Maya. He also um, continues, and I uh, continue, this is uh, in also indicated by the Indo-Aryan vocabulary discovered by Tunayan Bilev in Sumerian 
Shoka 3000 to 2000 BC, which came to southern Mesopotamia as a result of the maritime trade uh, of its inhabitants with early and mature Harappa. Now, the Indo-European dispersal through the steppe zone of Eurasia pre preliminary data. Anthropologist, doctor of biological sciences, professor of the Department of Anthropology of Moscow State University, Derebin, states that the indo afghan variant of the Mediterranean race, are the oldest and morphologically closest to the Caucasoid Negroid trunk of all the Caucasoids, penetrated into Central Asia to the Kuban River Valley in Europe, Northern Caucasus, Arabia, and the Eastern Mediterranean. Head of the Ethnoarchaeology Sector of the Institute of Ethnology and Anthropology of the Russian Academy of Sciences Vinogradov states that the alluvial plains of Central Asia were populated from the south with the penetration of such a specific type of flint products as haunt trapezoids from the pre-keramic Mergar through northern Afghanistan, northeastern Iran, southeastern Caspian, southern Central Asia and the Aral Sea to the left bank of the Volga River in Europe, uh, southern western Siberia, and eastern Balkhash. Uh, this is the photo of flint trapezoids from Mergach, period one. Uh, and this is also period 2A tomb, uh, called tomb of the flint napa with horn trapezes uh, at the bottom. And you can see them. And this is the map drawn by me of the penetration of this uh, very specific type of flint products, uh, horned trapezoids from the pre-keramic Mirgar through northern Afghanistan, northeastern Iran, southeastern Caspian, southern Central Asia and the Aral Sea region to the left bank of the Volga, south, uh, southern western Siberia and eastern Balkhash. Migrations from southern Central Asia went to the south of the Urals and western Siberia and formed the Ural Aral cultural province and spread the arrowheads of the Neolithic Caltaminar culture type to the middle Volga region, the low reaches of the Ob River, the Obertish Interfluve, and the Altai Mountains in uh, 60 to uh, 28 BC. Uh, this is the map of the Neolithic Caltaminar culture. Spread. And this is the map drawn by me of the dispersal of the stone arrowheads of the Neolithic Caltaminar culture type. Uh, you can see the illustration uh, of these um, special arrowheads of Caltaminar type. Uh, and the uh, yellow arrows indicate the uh, migration of the population. Neolithic migrations uh, from southern Central Asia spread the stone irons or polishes from Mergar period one through the southeastern Caspian region up to the Dnieper River in the Ukraine, forests of Eastern Europe, the Urals, uh, Western Siberia, and Altai. These are the uh, polishes, stone irons or polishes from Mergar period one. And this is the map uh, drawn uh, by uh, me of the spread of the stone iron, so polishes from Mergach period one through the southeastern Caspian region up to the Dnieper, uh, forest of Eastern Europe, uh, the Urals, Western Siberia, and Delta. Now, Russian archeologist, reconstructor, traceologist, uh, caster, and candidate of historical sciences, Igor Garashuk states uh, that at the end of the sixth millennium BCE, the carriers of the Shibir Neolithic and Bishlak culture penetrated uh, from the East uh, Caspian region, the Middle Volga region, and created the Hollandsk uh, Neolithic culture of the 5000 BC. And this is the map drawn by me. You can see the uh, territory of the Sibir, uh, Shabir Neolithic culture, Mangishlak culture, Mangishlak uh, Peninsula. And the uh, arrows indicate the migration to the Middle Volga region, uh, making the Hollandsk uh, Neolithic culture of the uh, 5000 BC. Uh, similarities in the technology of stone processing and pottery and ornamentation of the Hollands culture of the Middle Volga region of the 5000 BC lead to uh, Sialk II in Iran and to Jaitun uh, in uh, southern Central Asia. And uh, the Hollands population used uh, stone tools and weapons, uh, pottery, copper ornaments, and uh, had animal husbandry, cattle, sheep, uh, goats, and horses. The Shabir Hvalins culture became the basis for the formation of the early Yamne or pit grave culture of the Eastern Europe. And this is the map uh, constructed by me 
you see the original uh, migration of the Shibir, uh, Neolithic and Kishlak culture, uh, the uh, formation of the Hollins Neolithic, uh, Neolithic culture of the 5000 uh, BC, and then the appearance of the early Yamna Petrace culture of the East Europe, uh, penetrating as far as the central. The Afanasiva Neolithic culture of Altai is derived from the Hollins Sredni Stogla culture and or directly from the Southeast Caspian region or the Southern Aral Sea region. The last opportunity uh, is uh, further corroborated uh, by the presence of uh, dentalum and carbicular shells uh, in Altai uh, uh, burials uh, that indicate the connection of, uh, of the Altai population with the Amudaria and Serdaria basins in the 3000 BC. Uh, these uh, shells could be the result of uh, migration to the Altai from southern Central Asia uh, directly or through eastern Kazakhstan. Uh, Doctor of Historical Sciences, Professor of the Faculty of Natural Geography of Samara State Social Pedagogical University, anthropologist Haflov states that anthropology records the presence of the Mediterranean or southern Central Asian type in the Volga Valley as early as the pre falinsk time and uh, its transition from the Hollinsk epoch to the early Yamnetic Great epoch. Uh, he continues that in the Hollinsk burial, uh, two burial ground, in the central burials with various inventory, which is usually considered the prerogative of belonging to the elite of society, mostly people close to the Mediterranean type are buried. Uh, the both um, um, Female groups uh, composed of the skulls of both Polinsk uh, burial grounds, uh, Polinsk 1 and Polinsk 2, clearly demonstrated a deviation towards morphological and Mediterranean forms, among which two are from southern eastern Caspian region, Jaitun derived Karadepe and Kiaxur in Margian. And this is the map of archaeological cultures in Europe at the beginning of the third millennium BC. We've already traced uh, the uh, South, uh, uh, South Central Asian uh, origin of the Yamna culture. And now let us uh, turn our attention to the coded ware culture of Europe. Fatyanova archaeological culture of the third millennium BC in Central Russia is a local variant of the culture of battle axes and coded ware. Based on the analysis of a series of radiocarbon dates from the Fatyanova sites, the lifetime of the Fatyanova culture is determined from 2750 to 2500 or even 2300 BC. According to the anthropology, the creators of the Fatyanova archaeological culture belong to the dolichocranic, uh, uh, that is narrow-faced and high-faced type, with a sharp horizontal profile and a strong protrusion of the nerves. DNA uh, from the uh, bones, uh, bone remains of the graves of the Fatyanova culture contained um, Y chromosomal couple group R1A1A1M uh, 417 and specifically the R1A1A1B2Z93 lineage. Uh, the Fatyanova population turned out to be curious of the male haplogroup R1A lineage uh, Z93 common in Central and South Asia. According to paleogeneticists, 58% uh, of the Fatyanova people had skin between dark and light, and 42% uh, were generally dark skinned. Please uh, look yourselves uh, how many percent of Fatyanova residents had brown eyes, and 75% uh, of Fatyanova residents had black or dark brown hair, 21% had brown or dark brown hair. The typical representatives of the Indo-Afghan anthropological variant of the Caucasians are narrow-faced and high-faced uh, dolichocrans with dark skin, brown eyes, and dark hair. Uh, so, Fatyanova Indo-Afghans, we may uh, already call them so, name them so, could not appear in Europe uh, or the Balkans in this form. Their anthropological homeland since the Neolithic to the present day uh, has been uh, the border region between Eastern Iran, Afghanistan, Southern Central Asia, and the Indus Valley. Uh, the Fatyanova archaeological culture creators uh, give us unconditional double genetic and anthropological confirmation of the theory, the theory of the Exodus as Indo-Europeans uh, Indo of the male lineage R1AZ93, specifically L342.2 uh, from the border of Iran-Hindustan.
Now, Ginsburg, uh, uh, if I mentioned, and the specialist uh, in anthropology and paleoanthropology, candidate of biological sciences, doctor of historical sciences, Trofimova, in their uh, common book, um, uh, state uh, that in the Andronova graves of Kazakhstan and in the Andronova burial near Samarkand, dated circa 20 to 1450 BCE, it is possible to trace the Mediterranean type. And here I have drawn uh, the map uh, to show you the penetration of Indo Afghans to the southern Aral region and uh, from there to the uh, 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 northern Kazakhstan. Type. So they were mo moving in opposite directions. Uh, that is, in the second millennium BC, the indo afghan population of the south of Central Asia was not a passive recipient of steppe migrations. The Keltaminarians of the uh, southern Aral Sea region created the Suyarganova culture. The carriers of the Suyarganova and Tazabagyap culture of the Rakshan Valley of the second millennium BC Possessed, among other things, Mediterranean Caucasoid features with indo dravidoid traits derived from Harappa and traced in the region uh, up to the 4th century AD. Originally, Suryarganova people, circa 20 to uh, 10 BC, were hunters and fishers. Uh, but uh, during the commercial stage, uh, there was a migration of the later now in the Afghan population to the uh, South Aral region. And they, uh, the Suyarganova people, became irrigation farmers. The basic anthropological type of population of Suyarganova people is Indo Dravidian, at the latest calendar stage with minor Eastern Mediterranean anthropological type characteristic of Andronova tribes. The candidate, uh, candidate of historical sciences, associated professor of the Department of Archaeology, Ethnography, and Museology, Altai State University, the head of the Anthropology Department of the Museum of Archaeology and Ethnography of Altai, Svetlana Tur, states that uh, the results of the study of the odontological traits uh, that are inherited independently of craniometric ones show that the population of the Andronova culture of Altai was genetically related to Caucasians of uh, southern origin from the Ganur necropolis of South Turkmenistan of the Bronze Age. And this is uh, the map, a simple map drawn by me to demonstrate this um, idea. This not, it is not idea, it is a scientific conclusion based on the study of uh, the teeth of uh, Altai population and Ganur population. And now uh, uh, my summary. Uh, archaeology and anthro anthropology not only refute the theory of the Indo-Iranians' penetration into the southern, central, and South Asia and Iran, but also allow to trace the migration of the population from southern, central Asia through the steppes of Eurasia to southeastern Europe. If we accept the theory of the dispersal of Indo-Europeans from the border region between Iran and South Asia. And thank you for your attention. Somehow, Mehargarh, though it is on the outskirts of the Harappan region, it seems to have had a major role in the dispersal of Indo-European through the Indo-Afghan area. Am I correct in understanding this? You see, uh... I uh, place, I locate the uh, original Indo-European homeland in the border region of, uh, between uh, South Asia, Hindustan, and uh, Iran. What is South Asia geographically? Geographically, it is not only the Republic of India, but it is also Pakistan territory and even uh, the Eastern Afghanistan territory. All the rivers flowing uh, to Indus, uh, Indus tributaries. Um, are also uh, part, their basins are also part of the South Asia. So, Balochistan is uh, also part of, at least partly, it is part of South Asia. So, for me, Mergarh territory is not out of South India and is not out of India. Uh, and uh, one more uh, thing, uh, uh, speaking uh, in, uh, at the beginning of the lecture about the earliest uh, Neolithic. Um, so far, earliest Neolithic uh, attested um, settlements of uh, this region, of the Indo European region. I have mentioned Pirana uh, upon Saraswati and uh, Merga.
Uh, and then I've mentioned the use of copper uh, starting around uh, the 6,000 BC in both regions. Uh, we uh, can't be sure that it uh, started earlier, but around this time. And uh, this means that Indo-Europeans uh, started to appear only with the use of copper because of their cultural vocabulary, we can uh, state this. Uh, no uh, use of copper, no chalcolithic uh, stage uh, of material culture, no Indo-Europeans. Uh, even if some people uh, came uh, from the West or from the North, it doesn't matter. They became Indo-Europeans uh, here, where they started to use copper already having Neolithic uh, productive economy. It is exactly here where they started speaking Indo-European languages, and uh, this earliest phase of their Indo-European speech reflected this chalcolithic stage of material culture, uh, animal husbandry, uh, set, constant settlement, uh, uh, um, arable uh, farming, uh, and so on, with copper use, with the use of copper and copper metallurgy. Only from this point of time, we can speak about Indo-Europeans. Before that, there were no Indo-Europeans uh, at all. There were some uh, different tribes. We don't know what language uh, they were speaking. And um, um, about Hirana uh, and uh, Mergarh parallels, there are some parallels uh, in both in the uh, stage development of material culture, Neolithic and then Chalcolithic, and also uh, there are parallels drawn between the mother goddess cult of Hirana and Mergarh. In Mergarh, it is uh, very eminent. It is very expressive, uh, starting from the very beginning. In Hirana, it is a bit uh, more informative, a, a bit less informative, I'm sorry. Uh, we just don't have as many uh, figurines uh, from Hirana as from uh, Mergarh, starting from the earliest levels, uh, about 100 of them already from the period one and two. But uh, these two cultures, judging by the um, similarities in their burial traditions, uh, they were uh, of one common stem. So I think they were both uh, connected with the appearance of Indo-Europeans. As for Aryans specifically, uh, Aryans um, originated uh, not uh, uh, farther than the western boundaries of the Indus Valley. As well. And uh, in the Aryan uh, homelet is part of the general Indo-European homelet. Yes, Penny. Maybe uh, not all Indo-Europeans originated in India itself, but they uh, originated uh, just uh, just to the west of it, in the, uh, on the boundary. It is very difficult to uh, trace all Indo-Europeans from India. Not all of them. Uh, if you have uh, watched the previous report of mine two weeks ago, I've tried to trace uh, Celtic tribes and many other tribes. Uh, but uh, as I've mentioned uh, at the beginning of this uh, report, uh, it is a very complex question. And uh, we should be careful to, to choose uh, right words to formulate our thoughts, so to say not to look unscientific, so to say. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Semenenko, you've talked about the um, R1A1 uh, gene, and uh, this is a bit of a bone of contention because some people claim that that is the Aryan gene and that that can be traced from the Yamnaya culture down to India. Whereas some Indian geneticists say that on the contrary, this gene originated in India and mm -hmm. is, you know, far more present in India than mm -hmm. in Ukraine. So do you have any new uh, new insights about this? Uh, mm, and thank you for your question, Dr. Conrad, and I am very pleased to talk to you. Uh, speaking about genetics at all, I am uh, not into genetics. I uh, just used this piece of evidence uh, to demonstrate you that this um, R1A uh, gene, uh, male uh, Y haplogroup, uh, by the majority of West 
to scholars connected uh, with the spread of uh, Aryans into India, in fact, can be demonstrated uh, to be uh, used as uh, uh, an evidence uh, to originate them uh, from India. Because uh, those Fatianova carriers of this uh, Aradin A, Y group, group, uh, they uh, just couldn't uh, have appeared in Europe, anywhere in Europe, uh, being uh, at the same time the carriers of the Indo Afghan anthropological type. So they were long faced, oval faced, they were uh, uh, high faced, they were uh, dark skinned mostly, they were dark eyed, and uh, they were dark haired. No way it is possible that these genes. Um, appeared in them in the north. They could have appeared in them only in the south and uh, because uh, R1A territory is now in uh, mostly in uh, the southern uh, Central Asia and uh, eastern uh, Iran and uh, Afghanistan and northern India. So we can say that uh, they most probably uh, came uh, from uh, here and not on the continent. And by the way, I have got an article uh, dealing with uh, R1A and R1B uh, uh, Y chromosome uh, couple groups. Uh, it was issued uh, about maybe some 10 years ago. Uh, there is one interesting idea. Maybe I will uh, report on it um, somehow uh, using uh, your channel or maybe some other means of communicating. Uh, that is my answer. Well, you see what is very uh, special here is that the movement of populations through Central Asia is mapped. That the actual out of India movement is being, is being put on the map. I mean, that's totally new. That's sensational. So is this, uh, you know, what are the future steps to be taken here? Thank you very much for high estimation of my, my, my modest work. Um, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, much of my today's report uh, is the contents of my article uh, published um, about uh, 2015 or 2014. Uh, I started from the statements, uh, very often repeated statements, uh, that uh, there are many traces uh, evidencing the movement of Aryans and Indo-Europeans to India and Iran from anywhere, but we can't say the same uh, in the opposite direction. So I decided to look for the information. Being a professional archaeologist, I uh, looked through many archaeologist papers of Russia and of Soviet Union and post-Soviet uh, uh, republics. And uh, I just was uh, perplexed and amazed to see that uh, they demonstrate these uh, very evident, very clear directions uh, of um, migration of people starting from Mesolithic and Neolithic and Chalcolithic and Early Bronze Age from uh, this Iran-India boundary uh, uh, through the South uh, Central Asia, through Kazakhstan, uh, to West Siberia, Altai region, uh, to the uh, Volga region of the Eastern Europe, and then uh, as far as uh, Ukraine and so on. Uh, uh, yes, it was a, a sensational. And uh, we, uh, in 12-15, uh, we had a huge discussion, online discussion in Russia, uh, it is uh, pub uh, published by me, the whole uh, text of it. Um, I was opposed at, at once by uh, five professional invasionists uh, of different uh, fields of specialization. Uh, I've already mentioned this during my uh, previous report. Uh, and I uh, have uh, proposed this uh, data. Uh, I have demonstrated them this data, and they just could, uh, could not... Uh, reply anything about this. They just uh, were pass passive-aggressive, so to say, and uh, could do nothing. So um, you see, uh, maybe it is not modest, but I'm probably the very first person uh, among the historians, professional historians, to trace uh, this uh, migration with the scientific data. 
uh, and uh, I'm just only one person. Uh, I, I need uh, more collaborators <laughs> from different uh, fields of science because it is not uh, the task for one uh, person to do all this, to embrace all this data and evidence and to analyze it and to make all correct conclusions. I'm starting doing one thing, then I cease doing it and start to uh, do the other thing. As you see, I, I'm trying uh, at one time uh, uh, study Rig Veda and Adharva Veda, South Asian archaeology, then Iran archaeology, then the uh, art history of the ancient world, then the Chinese uh, data on the ancient Europeans, then the archaeology of the uh, Bronze Age of Eurasia, uh, criticizing the pseudo chariots and so on. Uh, it, it is not so easy, <laughs> as you see it in my reports. Uh, uh, probably there are some mistakes in my conclusions. Uh, why not? But uh, still, uh, they uh, raise the question. Uh, they uh, show us the way to explore uh, this data and to move on. That is my question, uh, answer. So another sensational thing, but not entirely new, is all these correspondences between Vedic data and Harappan data. And now that's, that's good, my compliment for that. But my question is, can you deduce anything about this, uh, from this about the chronology of the Vedas? Do you say the Rig Veda is older than the Harappan urbanization, as KD Setna said, or, or whatever, you know, what is your uh, chronology? Yes, again, as I've mentioned just uh, a few seconds uh, before, um, it's not the task for only one person to do all this, uh, because, uh, you know, Rig Veda is just huge and enormous for me. I've been studying it and uh, reading and rereading and interpreting and reinterpreting it for uh, since 1993. It's uh, uh, the 30th anniversary this year for me, uh, dealing with Rig Veda. Uh, so for me, it's like a notion. And uh, it is not uh, so easy to uh, study all uh, the texts of the Vedic uh, civilization uh, uh, carefully and uh, the same as Rig Veda. Yes, I have some ideas, but I think they are uh, not uh, very well grounded uh, yet to be published. Uh, for example, uh, uh, I have one idea about Aranyakas. Uh, I think that uh, Aranyakas, as you know, they are forest uh, teachings. And uh, uh, my idea was, but I don't know whether I will put it uh, in writing or not, that Aranyakas uh, composed when uh, there was this catastrophe, when uh, there was this transition from the mature Harappa to uh, late uh, Harappa. And when the great mass of people uh, moved uh, from the Indus and the Sarasvati uh, valleys to the jungles of Kurukshetra and so on. And they uh, literally uh, went into the forests and their uh, rishis started uh, composing these Aranyakas. Maybe this is true, maybe not. Yes, I also have some ideas about Mahaparata and um, some um, other um, ideas, but I think they are not well grounded. Um, here in Russia, being constantly opposed by great, great many uh, invasionists, uh, I am used to, uh, to give uh, out uh, some information only when I'm uh, totally sure that I can uh, defend it uh, from any attack. So maybe I will do it in the future, but uh, not now. Thank you. Um, since you mentioned the connection with Tibetan, if there are any new data about this, I know that uh, Igor Tonoyan Belyayev has written about this a few years ago. So has any new thing been produced? That's my very limited last question. Thank you for your question, Dr. Conrad. And, uh, it's a pity that uh, Igor Tonayan uh, Bilev uh, has now ceased to work uh, in this field, and uh, it is a very spe specific topic, uh, not for me. Uh, and as far as I uh, I am informed, uh, uh, there is uh, nothing new here. So we need a very okay. specialist for this. Right.
how come that the mongols and the mongoloids did not mix up with the indo afghans during the second or third millennium bc i am not an anthropologist myself i only use the data gathered and collected by other anthropologists uh, Personally, I uh, am in touch with uh, Dubova Nadezhda Anatolina, the head of the uh, uh, Margiana archaeological expedition. And uh, I use her data and the data of our other famous uh, anthropologists. As per them, uh, this territory from uh, at least Punjab uh, to uh, uh, Azerbaijan uh, Uh, it was the um, rather pure territory of indo afghan uh, population yes uh, there is uh, there were no uh, any mongoloid uh, 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 it's not incursion but uh, how to, to put it uh, influence uh, on this uh, population of uh, eastern mediterranean dolich ukrainic and uh, they were living uh, Uh, contacting mostly with the proto-European people from the south, uh, north, uh, from the steppe region, uh, those uh, who became the uh, northern uh, Indo-Europeans anthropologically. I mean, uh, Germans uh, and uh, Volts and uh, much of the Slavic population, uh, those groups of Indo-Europeans. You see, uh, the very interesting uh, point, uh, the very interesting moment in all the Indo-European history is that uh, this uh, secret, this mystery of how this um, uh, language, common language, was uh, spread among two uh, main, uh, two major anthropological types of Indo-Europeans. I mean, Indo-Afghan uh, Mediterranean type and uh, Proto-European uh, type. Uh, but um, As far as I know, the first uh, Mongoloid influence started to be visible only in the second millennium BC in Kazakhstan. Uh, as far as I remember, Begazi Dandibayevska archaeological culture of Kazakhstan of the Bronze Age uh, was uh, somehow connected with this Mongoloid uh, influence from the East. Uh, before this, uh, there was uh, the movement of uh, Uh, Proto-Europeans and uh, less uh, of uh, Indo-Afghans uh, to the east, I mean Tarim Basin, and from there even uh, as far as Mongolia. Uh, for example, these famous Tarim mummies, they are totally uh, Caucasoid, uh, and uh, they are looking like uh, the modern Germans, for example. Uh, In, in their clothes and their outfits and so on. Uh, but then uh, there was the uh, movement of Mongoloid people uh, westwards, uh, connected uh, most probably with the spread of the ancient Turks, and then uh, started the fusion. And uh, now uh, uh, this uh, region, uh, it is uh, the result of this mixture of uh, Mongoloid and uh, Caucasoid tribes, I mean uh, Central Asia, Southern Central Asia, uh, and uh, as far as uh, even Eastern Europe, uh, Tatarstan in Russia, and uh, Bashkirs and so on. Uh, but it is a very modern history. It is not the history of, of ancient Indo-Europeans. And uh, one, more t- uh, one more thing, interesting thing, again, I can only mention it, about the context uh, with uh, Tibetans. Uh, because um, uh, there are some authors in Russia also stating that uh, at least uh, some uh, of the uh, some members of the Harappan communities are people of uh, Sino-Tibetan origin because uh, uh, the uh, masks of the Matthew Harappa they demonstrate uh, people with uh, Mongoloid features. Uh, I'm not sure if it is true, if uh, it is uh, can be judged based on this evidence, but there are uh, such people in Russia, for example. Uh, I think that there were some contacts with, with the Tibet population. If you read Mahabharata, and it is a very interesting question about this uh, epic poem, it is great and it uh, contains a very different um, um, chronological material, different chronological layers. Some parts of it uh, describe pre-Rigvedic history. 
some part of it described post Rigvedic history. And uh, we have some legends uh, of a very remote antiquity, very archaic. And it is a very difficult work to um, solve all these uh, mysteries of Mahabharata uh, because, um, for example, the origin of Pandavas, uh, when they were uh, brought up somewhere in the jungles of the north, if, if I, I, I remember exactly, and uh, there were rumors uh, that they were not of uh, pure Aryan uh, blood, but they were somehow connected with the uh, Tibet population, with these mountainous tribes of uh, southern Himalayas, and so on. It is a very interesting question, and uh, yet uh, unsolved question. And uh, I will probably not be able to solve it because I, I just can't embrace it in my life. Thank you for your question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Samanenko, for, for a great talk. I have two questions. One is uh, from the field of genetics. What they have now found is that there's a lot of Armenian ancestry in ancient Anatolia, which explains, according to the geneticists, the Anatolian language family from 5000 BC onwards. And the same ancestry from Armenia, North Iran region reaches steppe as well, Kualinsk and uh, Kualinsk culture especially. How does that tie in with this? with your theory, because we see some Armenian ancestry would have reached uh, South Central Asia sites like Tepe Anau, Namazga, Sarazam as well. And there, it's there in the Indus Valley as well. So that is question number one. The connection maybe, of maybe, maybe, maybe I will ask the first question, not to forget. <laughs> okay, I'll ask the second question after you answer. Yes, thank you very much for your question. Um, as I've already mentioned, uh, we start to talk about Indo-Europeans when we have uh, the uh, preliminary uh, scientific restrictions uh, uh, obeyed, so to say. Uh, we can uh, state for sure that there was migration of Western people from the west of Iran and maybe from uh, Armenia ter territory uh, eastwards, uh, maybe up to the eastern Iran and southern uh, Central Asia, as you have mentioned it. Uh, but uh, um, you see, we, we can't use only one uh, piece of evidence uh, and uh, use it as uh, the support for the whole uh, theory of the Indo-European origin. We need uh, many uh, factors to coincide here. And uh, as far as I can see, uh, the theory of the Indo-European origin uh, in the border region between Iran Southern uh, Central Asia and uh, uh, Hindustan fits uh, these criteria. And uh, because we have uh, several uh, lines of evidence, uh, anthropology, archaeology, even genetics, no, no, not all of genetics, because it is a very difficult question, but uh, some uh, some ideas, uh, some conclusions of geneticists uh, I can uh, use in support of my theory. And uh, also uh, texts, uh, also uh, linguistics. Uh, so uh, when we have these uh, sciences, this evidence uh, combined, we can state it for sure that uh, um, as far as I can see uh, it, uh, Armenia territory uh, couldn't have been the original Old European homeland because it is too close to the uh, Shumer uh, and the Kat territory, uh, to the uh, pro uh, Nisit uh, non Indo European uh, territory, to the uh, uh, very ancient peoples of uh, Natufian origin, and so on. Uh, Indo Europeans is a bit different, uh, not a bit there, very different from this uh, region. Uh, and uh, uh, if you use this uh, Armenian uh, homeland uh, theory, then you um, somehow ignore all the information of the Vedic texts and uh, of uh, the uh, Avesta data uh, mentioned by me in my previous uh, report. Uh, um, you see, uh, uh, it is very... Um, Fashionable now to use these uh, newly uh, 
uh, obtained uh, genetic data for uh, judging and for drawing maps and uh, so on. But uh, I think uh, uh, it, it is not yet the time to uh, make the final conclusions in this uh, field. Uh, I've, I've tried to use uh, genetic data some 10 uh, years ago. I was very inspired by them. But then I understood that it is too early to use it. Uh, only some uh, conclusions uh, could be used uh, uh, for sure. Uh, but not all of them. And when people say uh, Armenian ancestry and this ancestry and that ancestry, what does this mean? Uh, Indo-Europeans uh, were people speaking Indo-European. Mostly they were of Indo-Afghan uh, anthropological type. Uh, Armenian people are of totally different anthropological type. Just compare the noses of Indo-Europeans and of Armenians. And you will get my point. It is absolutely different anthropological basis. If they were the uh, originators of Indo-European speech, how did it happen that uh, the vast majority of Iranians and uh, Indo-Aryans uh, are of uh, uh, Indo-Afghan type and not of this Armenian type? Do you see the Armenian anthropological type spread as far as Mirgar, for example? No. So where were these people spreading uh, in the European language? This region is very densely populated. It has been populated for at least 8,000 years, uh, starting from now, uh, moving into the past, by the Indo-Afghan type, the Eastern Mediterranean type. Uh, there were uh, no incursions of other anthropological types to this region. So uh, how did they... Uh, managed to uh, um, transform the Indo-European culture to the ancient pre-Iranians and then Iranians and pre indo aryans and uh, uh, the indo aryans themselves. Just, uh, uh, just imagine, uh, imagine to yourself, uh, to yourself the um, vast majority of Vedic texts. Is it possible to transform all this uh, great uh, mass of information? I just can't imagine it. Uh, by some local uh, group of people migrating from the West, from Armenia territory. I don't think it is possible. Uh, sorry, maybe my uh, answer won't uh, please you, but it is my opinion. Thank you. My second question is, it, it's a different topic. Could you talk about Soviet politics and how the politics and nationalism led to the Sintashta Arkham complex being identified with Indo Iranian, Zarathustra, Rishi, Rishi Dadhyanj, and, and all these. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Could, because in India, we do not. Mm -hmm. I uh, understand your question. Thank you for this question. It is an acute question of Russian pseudoscience, so to say. Now, and uh, speaking about Sintashta Arkham discovery, this culture was discovered. Uh, not very long ago, uh, somewhere around 1974-1975. Uh, uh, it's a, an interesting fact that one of my uh, university professors, Professor Brechin, was one of the first to excavate Sintashta burials uh, alongside with Gening and to propagate this uh, theory of the chariot warriors of the Sintashta Arkham type, uh, conquering the whole of Eurasia. He was my teacher, uh, university teacher. And um, then uh, came the collapse of the USSR. And firstly, uh, the uh, Moscow and uh, Leningrad, uh, that is capital scholars uh, of very high standard, archaeologists and anthropologists, uh, they uh, didn't take this idea, or, uh, they didn't welcome this idea. They criticized the excavators of Sintashtar Kaim uh, cemeteries and settlements severely uh, for uh, partly non-scientific character of their uh, conclusions. But then came the collapse of the USSR, and uh, Russia, a new country, needed uh, new ideals, uh, new uh, uh, models of the perfect past, so to say, and now uh, they just use this uh, to live on, uh, to, to earn money, 
uh, they started uh, doing these uh, archives in Tashta museums and so on. They started uh, uh, reconstructing these Yudich chariots. Uh, uh, there are more than 10 uh, uh, attempts to reconstruct the, ch the chariots of St. Ashtar type already, but all of them are utterly unscientific, as I show in my books on chariots uh, and wheel transport of the Bronze uh, Age. And uh, the situation is getting uh, worse and worse because now they use the administrative resources such as the personal acquaintance with the uh, authorities of Chelyabinsk region. And uh, recently they have made up uh, one more uh, falsification uh, and they uh, made up a pseudo-scientific uh, uh, movie uh, propagating these ideas. Uh, so uh, uh, you see, if I am against this, it doesn't mean that all in Russia and in post-Soviet space are against this. Uh, I am, I am, uh, I, I am uh, one of the very few in Russia who is against all these um, conclusions. That is why I am severely criticized here in Russia. <laughs> and uh, I'm not so welcomed as uh, during these Sangam talks by you. <laughs> um, yes, I, I try to uh, fight with these uh, pseudo signs, but uh, it is difficult. Uh, still, I have some uh, people who share my views and um, even among uh, the professional archaeologists. For example, Igor Garashuk mentioned uh, previously one of them. And uh, I can pub publish some articles on this topic, uh, but mostly it's my own initiative. Uh, so uh, uh, because I have no such material resources as uh, they, I mean Chelyabinsk, Southern Bureau um, uh, archaeologists, because uh, the whole institutes uh, are working uh, over these topics, uh, propagating this chariot the uh, theory. It is very difficult to overcome. Uh, I will uh, try to do my best to beat it, but uh, I am just one person. Okay, thank you. Taking up uh, where you left off, I fully understand that uh, Mehergad is also part of the Harappan complex and the Indian subcontinent, South Asia and so on. So there is no doubt about that. I was only surprised because uh, Mehergad doesn't often feature in the discussions of uh, Harappan civilization and Afghanistan together. So that was the reason. Uh, one question I have is whether all this anthropological data on skull dimensions can actually be relied upon. Uh, because uh, now I think that evidence might be dated, given that genetics is a far more reliable thing. And uh, these skull sizes vary you know, considerably based on you know, even small genetic differences. And sometimes even large genetic differences fail to show up in skull sizes because it's a multigenic trait. And therefore, do you, uh, I mean, is there any move to actually re examine the uh, maybe inner ear bones, DNA from the inner ear bones of the skulls that are already being excavated and uh, you know, reaffirm whether these kinships are actually true? Yes. So uh, your question is very interesting, and uh, your question is uh, from the future of the science. Uh, you want uh, anthropology uh, work uh, in collaboration with genetics. Uh, it is beautiful, and everybody welcomes it. But it's not so easy in the science to do just uh, rust, and uh, then it it appears uh, out of nothing. Uh, and I totally can't agree with you that uh, anthropology is a, a not correct science. It is very correct science. Because, uh, for example, uh, if you read uh, Dubova's uh, papers, uh, she used multi-criteria uh, multi analysis uh, while uh, making her conclusions. Not just uh, altitude or latitude, uh, very, very many, uh, dozens of... of um, Dozens of uh, traits are uh, used uh, to uh, uh, to give the generali generalized data, uh, to give the generalized conclusion, deduction. Uh, it, it's absolutely not correct that anthropology is not a, uh, an exact science, uh, not as exact as genetics. They are both uh, uh, exact sciences, biology sciences. And... Uh, 
I think that in the future there will be uh, collaboration, a very close collaboration of geneticists and anthropologists uh, because we need to make a picture uh, of uh, how uh, such and such anthropological type uh, uh, connected to such and such uh, genome or such and such genes, uh, male genes, uh, uh, male lineages and female lineages and the whole genome of uh, uh, the human. It is uh, the science uh, of the future, not now. But don't be so harsh uh, judging uh, anthropology. No, I don't think that uh, you are correct here because uh, uh, almost all, I do not know any Soviet and or Soviet Russian and um, Russian speaking uh, anthropologist uh, of uh, studying this region. I mean, Southern, uh, Central Asia, Eastern Iran, uh, South Asia. Uh, uh, having other views. They all agree in this, what uh, have been reported, that this uh, anthropological type uh, is very ancient and it has uh, about uh, 8,000 uh, years of history here in this region. Just no other variant uh, of anthropological um, uh, population uh, 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 was present here. Uh, uh, all uh, that uh, happened after that uh, is not connected to the uh, early Indo-European history. I mean, after uh, Persian incursions, then uh, Scythian incursions from the steppe, and then uh, uh, Islam, and so on, Turkic invasions, uh, even Mongol invasions. I, I know about it uh, quite a lot because I've been studying uh, also medieval Indian history. And uh, we must also remember the, the terrible hangars uh, produced by the British Empire in Bengal and other parts of uh, India, where millions, dozens of millions of carriers of such and such genes died because of hunger, Brahmins and different other castes. Who uh, considers these facts, for example, judging this, that here we have uh, such percent of genes of that haplogroup, and here we have only such percent of uh, the genes of that haplogroup. What about the hunger in India, made uh, several times by the British Empire, uh, deliberately, uh, killing dozens of millions of people, carriers of specific genes? Nobody takes this into account, and it is a scientific problem, a very important scientific problem. The same is in Russia, for example. Uh, now, the uh, loss of uh, the Soviet people in the Great Patriotic War is estimated around 27 million people. But it is not the, mm, the final uh, number of, of the victims. Just imagine 27 million people uh, have died in the uh, middle of the 20th uh, century because of the uh, quite modern political uh, events and they were carrying some genes. And this totally changed uh, the uh, picture, the genetic picture of the Soviet population. Do you understand my point? And this uh, may be uh, true of many other uh, territories. Uh, for example, Mon Mongol incursions uh, and killing different uh, uh, nations and, and so on, and many, many others. Iranian incursions uh, to India, for example, and so on. Uh, this all should be also considered. Uh, I think that your question is uh, premature, uh, not because of your um, position, but because uh, the development of science uh, is not so fast as you want to it to be. It is the question of the future science, uh, so to say. Thank you. So uh, it seems that it's my day to issue clarification. So first of all, uh, I, I did... Um, I did not mean to say that anthropology is not valid or, you know, I'm just saying that if it is corroborated by genetics, it will make it that much better because physical anthropology has been around for a longer time than uh, genomic science. And it does have many uh, achievements to its credits. So I, I'm aware of that. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to ask you is this uh, thing about the incursion of Central Asian genes around 1500 to 1700 BC 
which uh, according to david reich's group has occurred in the indian subcontinent but strangely enough it doesn't seem to leave the kind of archaeological trace that you are getting in the northward movement i mean what is what could be an explanation for that yes 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 okay thank you very much for this question mm. <laughs> where was this incursion of the genes uh, and how was it dated by the 17 to 15 centuries bc who dated it who from where did they take this data from a tiny piece of land in the swat valley in the north uh, western uh, farthest corner of the south asia from a very tiny piece of territory of the great hindustan uh, which was the corridor uh, for the people moving from india and out of india and they generalized this data and used them for the whole of the subcontinent and even dated it who dated it how did they date it it's absolutely unscientific as per me absolutely i just don't believe this uh, genetic data i believe i can find only the data of the genes uh, which are taken from the archaeologically dated uh, burials uh, or material by the other means of uh, dating when we have no this chronology it's just uh, uh, i'm sorry it is bullshit I just don't believe it. That's why I state that it is premature to use these uh, fashionable genetic conclusions in uh, studying uh, such difficult problems as Indo-European history. It's not the time yet. When they have enough uh, credible, uh, enough uh, reliable data, uh, I mean pertaining to chronology. Uh, of their genes then we will uh, speak about it but not uh, before that it is not yet the time for doing this and uh, speaking about this uh, article of several dozens of geneticists uh, reich and uh, so on uh, uh, i i just uh, do not accept this uh, because i think they are not truly scientific for me so based on my understanding of their interpretation is that they have data up to the swat valley just as you mentioned right and then what they do is they take the data of contemporary indians who have been endogamous for at least 2000 years right approximately and so it is a synthesis of those two pieces of data and uh, the way i understand their their conclusion is that if you synthesize these two pieces of ancient and contemporary data it can be explained by a model that postulates an incursion from central asia into india uh, is- yes yes i see you uh, your point uh, please uh, try to understand me uh, how uh, can I, how personally i explain this uh, is that there was inc- there were incursions from central asia to india and not one time but all of them were in the historical time not in the prehistory Uh, as you have seen from my uh, previous report just uh, made by me uh, at least up to 1000 bc there were no incursions uh, to the south of the zirafshan uh, valley and to the uh, south of the hindu kush ridge uh, from the central asia to uh, india afghanistan and so on and speaking about run by the way we have a very eminent uh, Iranian uh, scholar I mean um, Iranian uh, Russian speaking Medvedskaya uh, she is uh, uh, an archaeologist uh, specializing uh, on the uh, iron age uh, archaeology of Iran and she states uh, in her uh, book uh, recently published several years ago that uh, there, uh, there are no traces of step incursion from the north to run or the so called arms no uh, only just uh, the wishes of these geneticists and so on evasionists and if they came after 1000 uh, uh, bc it is very late for the rigveda for the atharva veda for the brahmanas aranyakas upanishads and the iranian avestan texts and so on it is very late 
uh, as per me. Uh, I've tried to demonstrate it uh, during the first uh, report that too many factors contradict uh, these uh, conclusions. And that's why I consider them unscientific. Uh, probably incorrect, maybe not unscientific, but incorrect. But anyway, uh, so the other thing, one thing that seemed to strike me purely on the basis of a pattern is that the spread of Indo-European languages that you have described on the map roughly parallels the way in which Buddhism spread in approximately the same area. I mean, I don't know. Uh, am I just seeing things or uh, is there, could there be something underlying this uh, pattern? I mean, this pattern that I think is there. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your question. It is a very good question. Of course, uh, the earlier the time, uh, the more it is connected with religious beliefs. And uh, yes, it is a, a kind of um, a plot how it could be. Uh, so, of course, Aryans coming out of this uh, homeland, they were spreading not only culture, I mean material culture, but they have uh, they also spread their religious beliefs. As I have tried to demonstrate uh, in my first report, they uh, really brought some pieces of this religious belief uh, as far west as uh, Gaul, for example, speaking about the parallels between the Gallic uh, goddess, uh, uh, Equid goddess, and the uh, the Gvedic and uh, Harappan Shasa Diti mother goddess. And about this uh, Soma cult, uh, Soma being this, uh, uh, depicted as the uh, bird of prey uh, sitting in the vessel. It is a purely Rigvedic uh, motive and very, very important for the Rigveda. And it is carried on uh, through the whole of Iran, back to Amargiana and up to the Kittite kingdom. Uh, this cult of the goddess uh, riding uh, uh, on zebu bulls, naked goddess or getting naked goddess, again from the Rigvedic and uh, Harappan, uh, early Harappan and Meteor Harappan, and even pre Harappan cultural sphere, also uh, was carried uh, throughout uh, this region up to Greece and even further. Yes, it, it was exactly the same, but it doesn't mean that they spread on religion. They spread uh, material culture as well as uh, spiritual culture. But spiritual culture we can explore only by using material embodiments of this culture because we have no texts of these early Indo-Europeans uh, spreading from this homeland. Uh, my point is that uh, these two uh, these two migrations that spread culture or language or whatever or religion uh, would have followed geographically uh, tractable routes. That is areas, uh, you know, trails that are being passed for a long time that are in use. So I think that that might be the reason why it is convenient to go from one place to another using old trails that other caravans and more ancient people have already done rather than making a new trail. And since transportation has not, did not materially improve until the industrial age, you know, I think uh, it is probably reasonable to say that Buddhism used the same road that the old people, the older cultures might have used. Because the geographical passes and other things would have been, you know, say just as convenient at the time. Uh, one thing that intrigued me in your, uh, whenever you refer to texts, you refer to the most ancient, which is the Rig Veda, and the most recent, which is the Atharva Veda. Does the Yajur Veda figure somewhere in this, or does it not have data? Um, uh, thank you for your question, but uh, I, I want to make a remark. Uh, pertaining to your previous uh, uh, reply uh, about uh, Buddhism. And of course, uh, this religion spread uh, along the very ancient great roots. Uh, and these roots were established uh, 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 in Paleolithic time, even, then in Neolithic, and then Neolithic and Neolithic. Here, uh, in this report, I demonstrate only starting from Neolithic with some Mesolithic roots uh, of Nergah. But it was, of course, even earlier. 
it is it is evident, uh, but it doesn't uh, mean that there was no migration along these routes. They were just comfortable these routes, and they were just uh, very useful to use them. And uh, now about Yajurveda, uh, as I've already mentioned, it is very it's, it is not an easy task to study some hitas. Uh, because, uh, you know, in Rigveda there are uh, 1089, uh, uh, and, uh, 28 uh, hymns only in Rigveda. Russian translation contains uh, three volumes, very thick volumes. And you need to read it and reread it and uh, think and rethink and think it over again and again uh, for you to know. I've been studying uh, uh, Rigveda for 20 years before I uh, realized that there is a very developed mother goddess cult, Yoni cult, uh, a female cult in the Rigveda. I just couldn't see it because nobody could see it. Because every generation of Vedic scholars uh, told that uh, Rigvedic religion is, uh, is patriarchal. And not uh, th th there, is, there are no female cults in it. That the goddesses of the Rigveda are very weak and not bright. Only Ushas, maybe, and so on. And when I started to think the other way, I just understood that it is absolutely not true. That Rigveda is totally female. That Rigveda has a very developed mother cult. And then I discovered the Pralingam cult in the Rigveda. But only after 20 years of studying this text, only this text. And uh, you see, it is a very um, uh, time uh, consuming job and uh, it, it needs many efforts. Uh, that is why to study Kyajur Veda, uh, it is not for me, it is very difficult for one person even to, to study only Rig Veda. So, just to let you know, uh, you'll have to be a little bit patient with. Uh, us because we are not very familiar with the literature that came out of Russia or the former Soviet Union on these topics. So, I mean, when you make your presentation, many of the names that we see, uh, we are encountering for the first time, whereas we are more familiar with the Western European literature. So that comes back to the thing that you're saying about you're being just one person. Perhaps uh, all the, you know, former Soviet countries, could get together and build a database of these things. Now that it is possible to do such things, build a database of these findings so that other people can also, you know, uh, understand that there is so much to be learned from the uh, Soviet plus post-Soviet archaeology and so on. So perhaps, you know, you could try to get that going somewhere because uh, this is a huge lacuna I see in Indian scholars who are very familiar with the Western literature uh, that is available in e English, but uh, because of linguistic reasons, obviously, you know, we can't do the Russian part. So perhaps you could do a little bit on that. <laughs> that that is again in the future, or is there something going on? Well, thank you for your question. Um, I have a bit of experience of uh, of working of being a scholar, firstly, I. So I am not at all optimistic about this. In Russia and in all post-Soviet uh, countries, uh, the uh, science is in crisis now. And uh, I don't see in the visible future the opportunity to combine, uh, to make it, to create a collective uh, of scholars to do this huge and very difficult work. Uh, they are not interested. They are interested to propagate the pseudo-chariot incursions of the pseudo-Aryans from the southern Urals in all the directions, because it somehow plays on the nationalism, uh, uh, Uralian nationalism, because now Urals uh, uh, is the uh, Chakranapka, so to say, of uh, Russian Federation and of the whole world. Just look at the map they draw in their, um, in their this film about uh, the next uh, pseudo reconstruction or the pseudo chariot. Uh, no, uh, it is not possible just now because uh, I'm a realist. Uh, speaking about the translation of my own uh, works, um, 
I, you know, I work very hard and I just have no time and uh, strength to do power to do this. Um, Dilip Krant uh, from USA uh, uh, tries to translate some of my articles and he has translated uh, two or three of them and tried to uh, send them to Indian archaeology journals, uh, Pura Tatva and some others, but they were rejected. I don't know why. One is uh, one should have been published, but uh, it is still not published. And when I uh, proposed him to uh, complete my English translation of my book of comparison of Sri Aurobindo's uh, approach to the Rig Veda and Western approaches to the Rig Veda, uh, he uh, told me kindly that in India, Sri Aurobindo is now not fashionable and nobody wants to publish books devoted to this great scholar. Uh, so I don't see the perspective. Maybe uh, Sangam Talks uh, is one of the uh, best way, uh, ways for me to, to, to become familiar in India. Maybe this somehow will change the situation in this, but not, not generally, but individually. <laughs> that, that is all. You very briefly mentioned some Sumerian link. Could you just elaborate on that? Um, uh, you need to read uh, our article published by the Belgorod State University. It was published uh, 2014 or 2015 or 2016 or somewhere else um, uh, here. And uh, the authors are me and Igor Tanayan Bilek. I uh, prepared the archaeology part of the article, and he uh, prepared the uh, properly linguistic part of the article. Uh, uh, shortly speaking, he has discovered in the cuneiform texts of uh, Shumer and the Cut, dated to 3000 to 2000 BCE, uh, about a hundred of words. Uh, uh, that can be considered as uh, in the Aryan uh, judging by their origin. And the only possible way of getting them to uh, Sumer is uh, through the sea trade, which was uh, developed uh, exactly in this millennium BC. So it is one more uh, proof to uh, place the uh, homeland of the Aryas in the Sindhu Valley and in the South Asia. Um, and you know, by the way, that Melucha, uh, uh, the name that Sumerians uh, gave to uh, the mature Harappan civilization, uh, corresponds to Mlechha, yes? It is a common knowledge. But what is interesting chronologically, is that, that the word Mlechha and the word Mlechhati uh, uh, is not mentioned in the whole of the Rig Veda, for example. So it is one more proof that Rig Veda was uh, composed before the uh, starting of this uh, trade uh, of the Matyo Harappa uh, or Melucha or Vlechha uh, with these um, uh, Shumer uh, traders. Because uh, as I see it, probably Matyo Harappans uh, called the Shumer traders Vlechhas. For them, they were Vlechhas. They were Aryas, I mean Matyo Harappans. And these traders were Mlechkans, and they called them Mlechkans among themselves. And Shumer's, uh, Shumerian traders started to un understand this as uh, the name of this country, uh, Mlechka Melucha, and started to name it so, Matyokhara. Th this is how I see it. Uh, this is one more consideration you should take into account. Uh, yes. And uh, in this article, uh, these words, uh, of course, they are given uh, in Latin uh, letters, so you can judge yourself uh, whether he's correct. By, uh, but believe me that Igor Tanayan Belayev is one of the greatest in this uh, I, I, I know of. Uh, he is really uh, like a whale uh, uh, diving into the depth of the uh, linguistic ocean. He just uh, goes up uh, down to the roots of the speech. He's very brilliant. And uh, I totally uh, admire him and uh, love his ideas, uh, but he doesn't publish them. For example, he has discovered uh, Aryan words even in the ancient Egyptian language. 
but he has not published this information uh, so far, and uh, I am not sure he will ever do this. This is one more direction of search, because there are uh, common words between the ancient Egyptian language uh, and uh, in the uh, ancient in the Aryan language. But to compare these two different languages, you need a specialist of a very high standard. And the wish to explore this question, mm -hmm. to, uh, to work over this problem. And uh, just uh, there are very few people who can do this in the world. That's why I'm not very optimistic about this, but this is uh, the future. Uh, it will be done in the future, I hope. That is my answer. So uh, one of the things is that uh, the the Soma wor worship and the usage of Soma is a very critical feature of the Rig Veda, at least. But uh, where, uh, its origin seems seem to be in Central Asia. So do you think the Soma uh, worship and Soma usage is a late introduction in, in terms of Rig Vedic history? I mean, what is the view on that? Because the geographical regions are somewhat off from the region of Soma. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for your question. Yes, I see what you mean. Uh, you know, uh, speaking about Soma worship, you should understand that there are two Soma worships in the Rig Veda. One is inner worship, mystic worship, and it is not material at all. It is inner psychological, spiritual, totally spiritual worship. It is the true worship of the rishis of the Rig Veda. And uh, it is uh, said uh, uh, openly in the Rig Veda itself. In the 10th mandala, you may read it yourself and uh, proof, uh, check me. And uh, what about uh, the second? The second is uh, the outer worship, the material worship, using some uh, chemical substance extracted from some plant or maybe mushroom. Nobody knows it exactly. The problem is uh, that because Rishis of the Rig Veda used this uh, symbol of the outer worship to describe their inner worship, uh, they, make, uh, they made the uh, problem of identifying the true Soma plant or the true Soma biological species uh, almost impossible to solve. Because there are more than 150 prototypes to the uh, physical Soma of the Rig Veda. And still nobody knows for sure what was the real prototype. And all in the Rig Veda is symbolic. When you laugh at me, I, I do not mean you, I, I've read some comments uh, about uh, my person that I, uh, I am too spiritual in understanding Rig Veda. These people, they just don't understand the fact that Rig Veda is the product of a yogic uh, experience. It is a very high spiritual creature. It is totally spiritual, and it is totally symbolic, and it uses symbols, and you may never be sure that this symbol in the physical reality means uh, exactly this uh, kind of thing, and not that. You must be very careful with this. You must be very sure about this. And when you speak that uh, Soma is of out of India origin, uh, uh, how do you know that the geographical terms used in the Rig Veda describing this Soma origin, they are not from South, uh, South Asia? Uh, Sharyanavat and uh, Mujavat and so on. Who knows where they were in the Rig Vedic times? Who knows what uh, Rig Vedic rishis meant by this? Uh, for example, Sharya, if I'm not mistaken, it's something like short, yes? Uh, it, it is a, a, a very important symbol of the Rig Veda itself, uh, because, for example, uh, for example, spears and arrows are very important symbols for the Rig Vedic teaching, and so on. Personally, I think that yes, there were maybe not even one, maybe several uh, out, uh, uh, so, uh, not to say soma worships. They were uh, sacred uh, drink worships. For example, in uh, Bactria Margiana, they uh, definitely had some sacred drink and they had special rooms for making this drink and special vessels. And yeah, they used the Phaedra and some other plants. And I agree with this, but this is not true Rig Vedic cult. This is only the outer cult. So when you ask me about 
what is the origin of the soma worship uh, i just uh, i'm perplexed because i know that auric veda the soma worship the uh, worship of the inner soma is just it is inseparable from Rig veda it is one of the most important elements of the Rig vedic teaching so i'm absolutely sure that uh, Rig, uh, Rig vedic soma worship uh, originates uh, from uh, the homeland of the Rigvedic rishis, that is from South Asia. But speaking about outer worship, yes, there were some other worships in Balochistan, Afghanistan, uh, Eastern Iran, and uh, they maybe were even called Haoma or some Soma even, but uh, they were not the Rigvedic. That is my, uh, so I can't agree that uh, the Soma worship was uh, foreign to the Rigvedic culture and to South Asia. Okay, this is a question related to how your findings might uh, corroborate uh, Srikant Telegri's inferences. So, according to Srikant Telegri, the uh, Dasharagya battle, the battle of the ten kings, is probably the time at which, uh, is close to the time at which many linguistic branches dispersed from India. So, what does the archaeology show that, I mean, does it match with the time horizon that Srikanth Telegri implies or is My answer is the following. Uh, I am always uh, asked uh, this question uh, about my attitude towards Srikanth Telegri. And uh, you see, um, I am very careful about him. Uh, when I tried to analyze his works, uh, I have found some faults uh, that I can't uh, accept. For example, uh, speaking about Soma cult in the Rig Veda, uh, pay attention that he uh, places, he dates uh, Rig Vedic uh, hymns devoted to Soma, dedicated to Soma, as not uh, the early ones, if I'm not mistaken. If I'm mistaken, please uh, correct me. But uh, just look at the Rig Veda cult of Soma. Nowhere in the Rig Veda, in the ninth mandala, uh, we have the description of the stone vessels or clay vessels for Soma, ritual vessels. All Soma vessels are made of uh, wood, and it is a very ancient cult. It is at once makes me date uh, the Soma hymns of the ninth mandala as one of the earliest in the Rig Veda because they use these uh, wood vessels and not other kinds of vessels. And by the way, all other uh, traditions uh, traced by me uh, while tracing this spread of the Soma as a bird of prey uh, in the vessel motif out of India, they used uh, different stone vessels and uh, gold vessels and silver vessels and clay vessels they didn't use uh, wood vessels. And only in India do we have uh, wood vessels for Soma, a very ancient feature of the Soma worship and of the ninth mandala of Rig Veda. And this only uh, piece of evidence uh, demonstrates me that uh, Talagiri uh, is not reliable. Sorry, but uh, I know that all of you love him very much, but I, I, I'm, I'm not as optimistic as you about this and about Dasharajna again uh, my scientific teacher is Sri Arabin as I have already uh, mentioned it and uh, I will do it many times uh, without uh, Sri Arabinda I wouldn't have started uh, studying Rig Veda and Indology and so on uh, so and he uh, sees Dasharajna battle as totally symbolic event as the event, uh, he even uh, he uh, doesn't give us the clue. I have found the clue myself in the Rig Veda, uh, because it is told in the Rig Veda that Dasha Rajna happens in Manusha. So what is Manusha? Manusha is con connected with, with the Manu. And who is the Manu? Manu is the personified mind of the worshiper. So the whole Dasha Rajna battle happens in the uh, mind of a yogin who sacrifices, self-sacrifices himself. And uh, speaking about the Vasishthas, who play a very important role in this Dasha Rajna battle, uh, they are totally symbolic, those Vasishthas. Uh, because uh, Vasishtha in the Rig Veda uh, doesn't mean only the family of the rishis, famous rishis, 
but also the most inner and most luminous uh, powers of uh, the divine soul in a man. So Vasishtas are the powers of soul. Then speaking about Indra, uh, you, I mean, you, those who uh, take Dasharajna battle as a historic uh, event, you take Indra as just a god. For me, it's just not a god uh, because he is the symbol of uh, overmind and uh, divine mind. And I do not see him as a, uh, how to say it, a divinized leader of the Aryan tribe with the Maruts as his uh, warriors. They are all parts of the symbolic teaching of the Rig Veda. Indra is uh, a power of consciousness, of mental and submental consciousness in the yoga. And uh, Maruts are powers of uh, thought and uh, pranas, vital powers. And they also take part here. And even Sudas himself. Sudas, the hero of the battle. What does it mean, Sudas? Sudas means uh, well-giving. So he's the sacrificer giving himself. And uh, on this very um, very symbolic base, Talagiri and the others like him try to build up the, this construction of Dasha, Rajnya's migration, uh, trying to identify the um, the uh, tribes uh, taking part in this so-called battle. It is absolutely unscientific. And those uh, tribes, one of them, uh, they are called as uh, not having uh, uh, manly features, for example. And who uh, has no manly features? Uh, I mean, out manly features in the regular. Vritra, Ahivritra, and uh, other uh, Danus and Dasus, uh, that is uh, powers of darkness in the Rig Veda. They are also symbolic. So you do not take into account this uh, inner symbolism of the Rig Veda and you take it literally. It is not uh, correct. It is not correct. Uh, the only uh, symbols of the Rig Veda should be used in archaeology that can be uh, justified by uh, the exact material data. Uh, that is why I have, uh, after uh, 20 years of studying symbolic Rig Veda, I've started to uh, search for these material embodiments of this Rig Vedic cult, to trace them in India and in out of India, stranding out of India. And I have at once found uh, 35 or 40 uh, motives doing this and criteria. Uh, so uh, my conclusion is, and I am uh, convinced uh, that Dasha Rajna was not a historical a historic event. It is a symbolic description of the inner processes of the Rigvedic yoga in the mind of a man. That is my answer. And about Kodi. Uh, Dr. Semenenko, I see most of your work online is uh, in, in Russian. So uh, could you let me know some place or our audience where we can read your books in English or your articles in English? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. And I'm delighted to be here with you. Uh, uh, and about my English works, yes, uh, I have uh, 14 English uh, articles published in different uh, journals. So they are uploaded on academia site, the same as my Russian uh, papers and books and articles. Uh, none of my more than 20 books uh, has been translated into English. Uh, because it's 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 not possible for me to do uh, two things at the same. It's not very easy. Maybe uh, s someone uh, knowing master in Russian will help me in the future to do this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm greatly delighted uh, communicating with you. And don't forget Satya Meva Jayate. Yes, Satya Mevjayate. Yes, Dr. Semenenko. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, have a the good night. The same to you. The same yes. to you. Namaste. Bye Thank bye. you. Namaste.